know now what I want to say in my intro for my podcast. I'm going to start with a warning to other creatives. Create like it's your last podcast, last graphic, last painting, last blog post. There's so many forces out there that want us to be bland, and that is not possible with this fro. I have too many thoughts about celebrating us, reading what I want to read, pointing out donkeys, what links us together and shouldn't tear us apart. I also give you bonus content through 10 Fro's Bar on my Patreon and if you become a melanated nerd. I also will share content about getting the real tea on reality TV. Join me in this episode of Tim Fro is reading for the wild ride. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Woohoo for me. I am slowly plotting to the 300 download mark and I still am completely astounded about how my podcast continues to grow by leaps and bounds. And also, I actually had the opportunity to submit the W9 for Dale's Angels Inc. to my publishing platform. I participate in programming ads and the payouts, you know, I'm actually, I may actually get a payout because you guys have been instrumental in listening and streaming my um, podcast. And I'm, for that, I'm eternally grateful. Also, if you want to just give me some feedback on some of the commercials that are being inserted, I'm thoroughly enjoying hearing about not just Fuego de Chao, because that really blew me away, but also Pandora, et cetera, and other services um, in the commercial. And it just makes me smile because it pushes me to continue to provide great content. And I'm just grateful to everyone that listens to my podcast. Let me go back. I need to check my... um, An update on my podcast, I just haven't checked in a minute. I want to basically give shout outs to people like, uh, this has not updated in a minute, but let me see. Really hasn't updated since the 20th, um, any of my reviews, but a sci-fi enthusiast rejoice, listener keeps the momentum going. That is from Roberta Dick, Bruce Marr, Bruce Martin, 46, thank you. And Jason Reeves, sip, savor, enjoy good drinks, eats, and more in the podcast. That's a, they're basically talking about my bonus content. And if you guys have not listened to the previous content, I talk about everything, mostly about the Dallas Cowboys, but also about the WNBA. And now we're into the uh, run-up to the playoffs as far as NASCAR. So you may actually hear me sprinkle that in for grins, shits, and giggles, as most people would say. It's just pretty dope seeing all the people that take the time to write the reviews. I've gotten a little over 21 hundred, close to 2,200 reviews, and they keep pouring in. And it's just amazing the amount of work I've been doing on the back end to get the podcast out there, working now in the creative space um, to hopefully get a collab that I'll be able to discuss on the show. And as always, thank you for your support. Continue to like, stream as often as you can navigate to my Patreon page or hit subscribe or send shout out, send me a gift. I take all offers. You guys are great. Thank you for your support. Butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading tin for 
So I sit here and realize several things. Number one, I went down a rabbit hole for, how you say, a rabbit hole in the internet. So I will be adding several books to my online bookstore, Far From Bill Street. This one I was able to find out about through, because as a podcaster, I am getting inspiration from other podcasts. And in particular, one of my favorite podcasts is Alicia, excuse me, Demetria L. Lucas from um, Ratchet and Respectable. One of Deneen Milner just dropped her first fictional novel, One Blood. I will be adding that. I'll mention it on the podcast, but it's kind of hard to do reviews of books when I don't have the rights for the books because I don't want to get slammed on the internet. But she had mentioned that there is a part of it, the story in general is about several generations of women. There is an adoption story in there that is has been a secret and one of the person that was adopted didn't learn until later in life that she was adopted. So what does that have to do with woke history? It has a lot to do with woke history because there is my racism and microaggressions even built into transracial adoption and just CPS and adoption in general. And then when I read up, uh, not just on adoption itself, I read um, an article in The Atlantic by Nicole Chung, who relates her own adoption story as it relates to another book that I'm going to be adding by, what's dude's name? Um, Gunner, Matthew Pratt Gutterall, called Skin Folk. And this starts out, Bob and Cheryl Gutterill saw their family as a kind of arc for the age of the nuclear bomb and attempted to gather two of every race, the family who tried to end racism through adoption. What in the fraggle knackle bull crap is this? Hippy dippy shit is this? When I read that, I was like, oh, I'm in for some bull. Because evidently, Matt, I was like, am I being con or punked? The author of the article in The Atlantic is Korean-American. She was actually adopted from South Korea, lived in a white community all her life, and for much of her life, she had no mirrors of herself. She was the only Asian-American in whatever little white place that they lived. She got some benefits of being white, even though she was Asian, but her family could not relate to her when the, for example, when the backlash and blame game for the COVID-19 pandemic started, she, they couldn't really explain the attacks on, the uptick on attacks of Asian Americans. Skin folk, the black arc, was because his white family in Jersey, the father was a judge, the mother was um, a teacher turned homemaker who adopted their children from Welcome House. Welcome House up until 2014 when it was phased out because of the change in international adoption laws was the first 
International Interracial Adoption Agency in the United States, started by the author Pearl, Pearl S. Burke. So I had to go down another internet rabbit hole. Pearl S. Burke was a Pulitzer Prize, Nobel Peace Prize winning author who was famous, had best-selling books, and she was women rights, racial justice, before it was cool. She was woke before woke was a word. And she dedicated her life to racial equality and women's rights. She firmly believed that recycling, she was just like the gutturals. Recycling and adoption are methods of global repair. But there was missed opportunities because they operated on what I call the color blindness as a color blindness as a means for ending racism. When you say I don't see race, that means that somehow that what what you're saying is all you see is white because everybody's the same but not recognizing that that person that is not the same race as you, their experience is gonna be different. Just because you don't see race doesn't mean Joe Bob and his skinhead friends don't see race. And what? how are you going to equip your children to operate in this world? What are, You want them to be in the best schools because they're all white schools next to the best hospitals when you take these kids to these places, but you never see any other representation of their race within your hometown, are you equipped to have the conversation with your sons? Because the Gutterals won't. This author, Matthew Gutterall, related when his, it seems like one of his adopted siblings of color was having some discipline problems. What did it directly stem from him being not fitting into this white world? Was it because he just had uh, microaggressions that he was presenting in school? We don't even know if he was a child of a drug addict, but he was unleashed or released to a system of discipline which we know now is a conduit right to prison because that's where he ended up. But because he was a discipline problem, his white parents didn't know how to deal with it and keep him integrated in this family. When love does not conquer all, when their colorblindness definitely did not conquer all, these families seem to be ill-prepared and ill-informed to address racism in the fullest extent, because you got to have these uncomfortable conversations. You got to, with law enforcement, with just within the social security system, housing, and other people that are backwards and will say things to them that are racially charged and mean to demean them and to put them in their place. They were never given or never were equipped with a separate syllabus to try to raise black or children of color. How do you react to someone that calls you nigger lips, that calls you, makes fun of your hair texture? How do you change a young girl's perception of her black body and her natural hair when the world does perceives her as not being ugly? On someone, a white girl like Kim Kardashian is seen as exotic, but in your small town in Minnesota, it can come off. They can use it against you to basically, basically double down on your weakness because they know that you have some, you feel some type of way about it. How do you explain to them George Floyd, Bland, and all of the people that die at the hands of law enforcement just because? law enforcement and other people from shopkeepers to school administrators think they have to be tougher on us because we're menacing just because their perception of a black male and even a short middle-aged black woman 
it's they've been ingrained to be that we are that, that we are menacing and can't trust us and it takes more an excessive use of force to subdue us if we get out of hand. Just because you wanted to do this great experiment, his family did this great experiment and it went to pot because they didn't get together until after the father had died. And then they made fun of, of their sisters who is of Asian descent, broken English. And it, and it 26 years, took them 26 years later to realize their teasing her about her English was actually racist. These, and I can understand why the Pearl Buck, that, that uh, welcome, that welcome house basically does not do interracial adoption because you got to be kind of hardcore to adopt somebody from another race in this country because you got to do what it takes to have the difficult conversations with them because even though they're going to get undivided, your undivided attention and generous generosity and love, not everybody is like that. But they also need you also have to be, the parents also need to be equipped with finding representations of people that look like that. They got to understand their own hatred, their own racist kind of microaggressions, their own, the colorblind and love conquers all does not work. If you are going to adopt someone from another race, are you equipped to genuinely show them mirrors of other people that actually look like them that are doing positive things. It's more than a Kwanzaa gift. It's more than taking them to the National Gallery and showing them art from the jazz era, et cetera. Are you equipped to expose them to all forms of music? Like for example, jazz that we created, the positive side of Billie Holiday. And also, who in the community now is doing great thing, but there are people and women and men of color? Are you equipped to have those conversations with teenage boys? Because your experience in law enforcement and even in school may be different than the little Matthews of the world. Knowing and being completely apologetic when they said the, when the Women's Cup 2015, the writer of the article of the Atlantic was sitting watching it with her white father. And he basically was saying, is this Japanese? The mom says it's Japanese Korean team. And the father was like, well, I don't know. It doesn't really, it doesn't make, they all look alike. And being completely apologetic. Number one, never saying some dumb shit like that in 2015. But at the same time, looking at your Korean born daughter and realizing that how racist that is and being apologetic and working through it, but not, but only being working through it grudgingly because just by chance, your view is racist and you need to stop that. There, you take on a lot of things when you actually choose to adopt. It, your intent may be great, but you also know that your love can't always protect them from the ills and the racist attitudes of the world. They're not going to be around you 24-7. So why? They're not going to be around you. You're, your kids are not going to be around you 24-7. How can you best equip them to deal with the world that we live in? You're going to have to have the scary conversations and to be in the moment so you can basically still develop well-rounded people that can go up against everything. I find that kids that are truly loved and are truly equipped and are truly international multicultural, those are the kids that seem to do well. Those are the kids that can write policy. Those are the kids that won't also give you sympathy, but they'll ride with you through the marches and will make the movement not, will make the movement like BLM mean something because they're not the ones, the allies, that you're just waiting. They call themselves allies or woke, but you're just waiting 
but knowing that they're just, they had, just haven't been caught saying something stupid because it's more genuine when they're given that they've done the work and they've been given the tools to work through it. And they're also teaching the other ones that look like them how to truly be woke. So what do I see when I read stuff like, I know my parents love me, but they don't love my people. This was an article by Rachel Hadzingham Baganos. <laughs> I know I hacked up her name. I got this one out of the Washington Post. And I think this one dropped back in 2021. And it's again, it's a compilation of views from tr other transracial adoptees. And I touched on it in the previous segment when I had the, when I basically inferred about how colorblindness is in itself racist. Because when I, when people like me hear people being colorblind, that means they only see white people. And they, and it takes a color people that basically say that BS a minute to realize what that is. There is a whole national association of black social workers that basically, and this was back in 72, when they took a stand against the adoption of black children against white parents, because they also knew that it takes more than wanting to be the white savior, because that your mentality is not going to save your kids from the colonialism, nor about the racist tendency and the racist leanings of American society as a whole. We just have witnessed the last closure of the Native American schools that basically ripped away Native American children and tried to re erase their Native American heritage. Because they realize, and they've been saying for years, outside of these uh, hippy dippy uh, adoption agencies, they realize that in order for you to adopt a child that is not your race, it's, it takes a lot of education, not a bunch of propaganda, not this colorblind rhetoric. It takes so much to be able to be, get the knowledge and the understanding and how to apply it. And not every couple is up for that task. Again, it takes more than, to, than love to raise a child of a different race, especially in this country. It takes an education, a great willingness, but it takes the work. All of y'all, not only do you need the information, you're also going to need therapy to be able to have the words and the tools to work through some of these things. They talked about how, uh, what's this child's name? Angela Tucker's family, how little information they're given in the, the adoption process about race. How wouldn't you? And they talk about how it was cheaper. They discounted us, black folks, kids. The fees to adopt them were a lot less. You could get, almost get a, a two for one how to deal, how to equip your kids to deal with when they make fun of the hair and the Asian kids, their eyes. What do they do? And not to blow it off and not to also belittle the child for basically feeling bad or feeling some kind of way when their features are made fun of in a derogatory manner. Having that talk, the grim rite of passage the talk about black kids and um, their relation to police or not so much. How to explain Black Lives Matter. matter. These are the things that, and what is my stance on international and interracial adoption? I'm all for it. I'm all for giving kids a safe place to stay and a one up in life because there's so much in our society that tears down people 
and kids of color. But you got to be able to, are you going to, are you equipped with to do the heavy lifting? Do you have the tools? Do you know what your privilege is? And do you know that privilege is, doesn't extend to your children once they walk out the door? No, it doesn't. Even you want it, even if a child has a health issue, you go to that white hospital because of integral race, racism, they might not get the same treatment as another child who is a different color with the same illness. That is a reality. So I'm all for it, but you got to just know it's a lot of work. You may have gotten us for a discounted rate, but it's going to take a lot of work to keep the black or child of color and wanting to do the work and to just to be the best parent that you can. It all comes with the territory. There's so many things you have to get over the collective PTSD generational PTSD. You have to get over all those things, knowing the background and the health status of the parents. And if they were with those, that family and that those people for that period of time, how making sure that they have what it takes to be able to work through those things. Therapy starts as soon as they hit your house. And being realistic I know that there's so many people that have good intent, but are you prepared for everything that your good intentions did not even consider? It's my home girl, Laquita J. Elmore, Najee. Lift every chair and swing till all them white folks scream. Thought y'all could run up on our black king. I'm glad the squad pulled up, dedicated to knock if you buck. May it resound loud as the rolling sea. Throw your hats high in the air until up comes with the chair. Swim the seas until our cousins come and they rescue me. Let this be a lesson to y'all. Remember the Montgomery brawl where white folks fucked around and they found out. I think I'm using the boredom of Real Housewives of Atlanta because I'm watching. This is a restream of the viewing. They have an opening of Candy's uh, and Todd's. Uh, movie, The Past. The Past was okay. And I just saw something. What was that? Oh, it was probably Kenya being fake when Marlo rolled up. And I'm wondering what's going on with Sheree's face. She does look swollen. And I think she visits the same cosmetic surgeon as Kim Zosiak does. I've said that before. But the more I watch this boring ass show, the more inclined I am to create. And what's the tea in pop culture? For the last week or so, there's a couple of stories that have gone viral. One was a girl getting bust upside the head with a brick and everybody spreading misinformation about her online because of her she had some questionable posts on TikTok prior uh but this seems to be real and the other one was about a girl who went out on a date twice with this guy on Tinder and he sold some ugly ass $1000 shoes when i saw these shoes in the New York Times oh and that one actually made it on the New York Times these shoes to me, look atrocious. 
And I'm like, they had to be some type of weird fad because you could see where it's like those feet shoes where the toes, you can see each individual toe. Well, this one is only the big toe is out. He stole her shoes, gaslighted her, then gave the shoes to his girlfriend. And then she posted them online because she was so thrilled to get some used shoes. And then come back, he says, you know, if I give you the shoes back, will you take all that stuff down? Um, didn't take it down fast enough because the internet does what the internet does. Somebody posted his Instagram feed or TikTok, located him and posted his entire government name. I'm not going to here because that's not the point. The point is y'all stupid. Both of these stories are dripping in misogyny. Instead of you focusing in on how wrong it is to attack somebody because they don't want to be with you and y'all stood by and used the same excuses as other people say, why am I going to put my life on the line or suppose he turned a brick, a brick on me? Well, there were three of y'all. Evidently, there were three people that stood by this woman watching her being attacked. That's that. The other one is y'all were so focused on why she hooked up with this guy after only one date and did it twice. Let him stay over. But no, y'all lost the point where he was cheating on his girlfriend and he stole from this girl. These, it is so sad to me that y'all completely missed the point. He did, the guy that stole the shoes is the, the lowest of the low because he basically stole something and re-gifted it to his girlfriend and was cheating on his girlfriend. But y'all were focused on the fact that she, the girl, that shoes was stolen, who is an adult, and she could do whatever she wants to with her vagina. Y'all have no control over that, but that's what y'all are willing to focus in on. And the girl that got busted upside the head deserved it and nobody's going to protect her. That drips again with some Kevin Samuels got it misogyny. And all of you people that have said have completely missed the point of why we don't protect black women and why people think it's okay to cheat on their girlfriends, black girlfriends, and steal from black girlfriends. Because that's, that's the thing, mistreatment of somebody else that you should love, respect, and protect. That's the whole point of those two stories. I, I don't see any other way around that. Do y'all? The Shade Bunch, the Shade Bunch. I hope turning up for checks to pay for fake lifestyles were to be a part of the Shady Bunch. So the reality of reality or unreality TV is the fact that Real Housewives of Atlanta, even the reunion is stupid. I stayed up and I watched part one of the reunion and it pissed me off because all they did was some stupid bragging on candy. What I'm finding is the greatest producer of uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta or the franchise, Carlos King, as well as I did not know that he was also an associate producer on the Love and Hip Hop franchise. But I'm getting more pleasure watching several stars be interviewed because that's more realistic than even the reunion this year. How sad is that? Carlos King just interviewed Jocelyn Hernandez. I was fascinated by it and some of her, and just learning about how she came to the franchise. When she left, she was the highest paid VH1 reality star. And her Jocelyn's Cabaret on Zeus, I believe. Also, she owns that and will be paid in perpetuity. 
How did she figure it out? And none of these other hoes figured it out. I want to watch the second part about if she is going to tell the true tea that if Cardi B has the career and popularity that she should have. But I think that is comparing apples to oranges because they are all famous and infamous in their own right. And both are married and both got kids. But, you know, it is what it is. Both started out on Love and Hip Hop. Cardi, from which you may not realize, actually started out and got on because she was a stripper, but she was a stripper in New York. And she started out on Love and Hip Hop New York and then blew up and was bigger than the franchise. Jocelyn is bigger than the franchise and also is getting still getting crazy pay in her own right. I don't know if Cardi was on the show long enough to carry the same clout and signing bonuses that Jocelyn did, but she made it work for what it was. Can't compare. Now we're looking at why everybody hate it on Candy Burris. She's all Club Shay Shay. First woman on the show. Um, and he goes over all her credentials. And it looks like Candy just recently may have gotten a, a, a breast reduction or tightening, mastopexy. She looks really good. And she looks more comfortable even in this dress with her mid drift out. Candy's in her 40s and she looks great. Still megawatt smile. And she looks better on this than she did in that tight dress for the reunion. And she's just talking about herself and vibing. And this is, and you can tell he absolutely respects her, unlike the player hating hoes on Real Housewives of Atlanta. So I'm more fascinated by this, and I'm staying up to watch this versus the reunion because I don't think it's going to be worth it. If I do see it, it's probably not going to be until tomorrow because kickoff for the season openers for Dallas and the New York Giants is tonight. I don't know if I'm going to be awake or waste my time to watch another disappointing because if the trailer or the sneak peek is any indication, I'm tired of Drew Lyon. I'm tired of not cousin Courtney and I'm tired of them player hating on candy. I'm just tired. If Drew would actually tell the truth, I would be more inclined or just be real, I would be more inclined to stay up and just record the Dallas game. But that's not happening. I'm going to at least watch the kickoff, and then I'm going to go on to sleep. So Dallas Cowboys versus the Giants over Real Housewives of Atlanta reunion because Real Housewives of Atlanta reunion even is boring. So I flip back and forth between the Dallas Cowboys game and the Real Housewife Part 2 reunion. Even with all the penalties, of course, the Cowboys game was bomb. But that BS, I didn't. I still don't understand why there was a Part 2. Sometimes the reunions is like a wrap-up or reconciliation or a reveal of on some unanswered questions in the season, but the season sucked and so did the reunion. That was the biggest waste of my time. I still don't even understand why. I'm with Drew. Why was Ralph there? Why didn't he answer a single question? Actually, why was Courtney there? And why was Sheree sitting there in her big face and that corset? Her outfit didn't make any sense. None of it made any sense to me. Nobody was being truthful. And I still don't understand why 
she, Sheree had the She Buy, She Don't Pay pamphlet when she could have had a, a, a lookbook for the fashion she didn't pay for. I hope Candy and Rashida do team up. And Nene, if swag is still open, they get together, they pay Tyree, that designer, and they dox her ass because it is obvious she don't pay, don't know shit about fashion business because she still sat up there in her all her fake phoniness. And I think she did have Botox. I didn't see a wrinkle. I didn't see anything. And Cynthia was on as a friend of the show, and they didn't even have her on a reunion. This did not make any sense. And it didn't make any sense that we got 16 episodes. It was completely disjointed. And then they have this reunion that still didn't make any sense. I'm confused. I'm bamboozled. And I'm tired of them playing in our face. Even if they had revealed more of the breakdown of Drew and Ralph's wedding, um, uh, marriage. But even that wasn't truthful. If they had revealed more about Kenya and her shop and the final on that divorce. It is contested. They keep making up shit. She needed to have been divorced. Her divorce lasted as long as Ophedra's, fake and Phaedra's divorce lasted. I just can't. They're getting on my nerves. But Roni is a whole vibe. I like Cy. Cy was just like Tanya was when they were in um, South Carolina. She could not. She said she was hangry. She was hungry. And she needed to eat. Every time they're around Aaron, her skinny ass, they never are fed. But Sai is going to get her grub on, and she ain't going to care, and she's going to call her on it, and you ain't going to talk her to death on an empty stomach. Why don't y'all believe that? She telling y'all how to treat her, and I'm here for it. I don't know about Jenna, though. There's something off about her, how she reveal herself to complete strangers, but not the people she's paid to be around. <laughs> well, maybe that's it. But anyways, I think it's going to be something up with Bryn and everybody, and it's going to be some mess. And again, I'm here more for that than the BS that is Real Housewives of Atlanta, because the real tea is partial reboot. Because the people, the mixture of the cast that they have on now, I'm not with. I'm not even with Sonya being on the show. Because I agree with, I think it was the guy from Kempfire. He was like, why is she on the show? She's a commentator on NBC. She's a four-time Olympic gold medalist. I don't think she's here for the mess in her alignment with Marlo and Sheree. She don't pay. Doesn't make any sense with me at the person that she really. And it's just so sad because the person that she should be aligned with, that's going to be there. The candy Burris, that's who she should be aligned with. But she is taking on the persona and the shade of she don't pay and Marlo Ho. For what? Because she feels sorry for them? She needs to be careful who you hit your wagon to because you going down with them. Because I don't believe, because they only, she doesn't understand that she is only with them for their shine. For, because she doesn't really push back and and they are with her on her shine. They're not doing anything. She don't pay and Marho, what are they what is their purpose? They don't have legit businesses. I don't believe that the archive is anything but a front to recycle Marlo's clothes, just saying. I don't believe she is in a real relationship. 
with Scotts Bright, as Kenya said. And she don't pay, ain't got a real business because she had paid for any designs and she's not realistic. She's willing to basically skimp and, and scrunch, but she's not in the business of having any sustainability or quality merchandise because of the way she treated the Tyree billionaire baby. Just saying, just saying. So, Roni is a vibe. I can see it going for 20 some odd episodes, but I think they cut the episodes for Real Housewives because even if they got the footage, I don't think this production staff knew how to and what to air because they had made, they, I think they realized mid season that they made a mistake in these casting choices without um, anybody being taped or anybody really auditioning because their casting choices made the filming of the season challenging. It is obvious that none of these people are friends because why did they get to the reunion, which was filmed in July? Mind you, they wrapped the beginning of the year and nobody knew that Sonya had gotten pregnant again. Really? Really? It is obvious that they're not tight. None of them. And the only way that any of these people are going to come back, if they bring the OGs back that are willing, that are actually friends and not some um, moment stealing issues, fakery of the Courtney's of it all, because we don't need to see any more of that. On part one of the Real Housewives of Atlanta season 15 reunion, Sheree said that the designer got paid, here are my receipts, and you have Rowan on social media saying he was paid, he was paid. Uh, she Rowan, started with me. Who has no so sin in the clear. game. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. So Rowan was helping. I paid Rewind, Rewind oh, paid and, him. And she's back saying, then. Back she is then. saying, don't uh, believe everything you read on the internet. We already told you, he was speaking out on social media saying that she better be tread lightly because I have my receipts too. Well, now he's speaking out and saying all the things that make complete sense. And it's very consistent with what she by someone else has claimed over the years. So let's unpack some of this. Part one, big shout out to Kim Fire in his breakdown of, again, she by don't pay nobody, has not changed, and she's a bone collector. She doesn't pay her bills. She has a, a, a sketch um, association with creditors. The only way she has a net worth is because she holds on to all of her money. And then she hides in her house that's in a trust that nobody can attack. I just, it's just crazy to me. Shady dealings. And y'all thought she was going to bring the cast together? And they went to Portugal for ev for everybody. And it was supposed to be a mending, but it was so janky that Kenya basically said, y'all are ruining the show. And the show is ruined because she was only there to try to look fabulous. This is Sheree Whitfield and have her healing, but the rest of the cast be damned, just like she has been for all these years. She's admitted to not being loyal to anybody but herself and the wig. And until the wig flips on her, She's only going to be loyal to Sheree Whitfield. And that's why people can feel free to go after her just because. So, run tell that. Why are y'all shocked that Sheree is not been loyal? She ain't been shit since, what is this, season 10? And she just basically got back on the show and they in Barcelona, and she watched, and she knew 
of Kim Zosiak stupidity and racism even back then. Why do I think that when the entire cast band together in season five, Sheree wasn't on that, and when they refused to film because Kim was tripping, that Sheree wouldn't have been in that because it wouldn't have benefited her? That's the bullshit that I'm concerned about. She knew of that tacky filming, invited the wig to Nene's house, knew, and that and knew that girl, Kim's baby kid daughter, did that film and didn't even give Nene a heads up. And all Nene said, which was shady, but it was true about all the crap that Kim was popping. She wouldn't speak to Nene, but took a picture of her, her Bentley. Like she, and then couldn't understand why Andy wouldn't defend her and all of her negativity. Like she was privileged. Like she was above the negativity that was her. Girl, bye. That's why I don't think Sheree nor Kim need to be on this show. They got a whole storyline from the lies that Sheree has told. They could basically, the billionaire, the guy that she didn't pay, he said he got the specs and ready to go with the line. Wouldn't it be funny if Candy and... Uh, what's her name? She also has a store. Rashida from Love and Hip Hop. You talk about cross activity, and they pay Carlos King to come back, and they had Portia Williams Gabadia model this shit. Why wouldn't they buy those designs? P give him a scratch, put it on tags, and I can't remember Rashida's store, but sell out like he predicted it. And then throw it up in her face. Why won't they start off with a reunion with Sheree with egg on her face with the follow-up pamphlet or Candy burning that pamphlet because Sheree is deflecting from her own mess? Why don't we go there? I would watch that. We would break the internet and break TV Real Housewives of Atlanta would not only be put back on the map, but it would break TV history and it would give them the most views of all times if they ran with that storyline instead of the bullshit they've been running for the last two years. I would, I would love that. And whatever Brink's truck that they had to pay Portia, that would be bomb because they could bring back Tyree and them and they could build up to Sheree's demise and she would be looking crazy. And she did all of this mechanism thinking she is smarter than the average bear and they would prove that she doesn't know anything and that the designs, if she had just listened to him, she would have, and be it would play hate candy even more because the designs that she refused to pay for that she paid four hundred dollars for and scammed homegirl Wawan for and Tyree and that would put her on the map and the fourteen year old store of Ta girl she would be livid but she thinks she's smarter than everybody because she has supposedly a better weave because her body was good, but she is stupid. She's probably one of the stupidest housewives on this show. And she would just give them more fodder to hate. And it would be, they would do a reverse reunion and it would be so hilarious. They would be back to the 5 million views per show and it would be must see TV because everybody would know and just to see her face be broke. And Portia would earn, Candy would earn, Rashi everybody would get a check because her face would be broke. 
She did all these machinations, all these made up storylines and BS uh, sip and see for a kid that ain't even hers. Probably not her kid, her grandkid. All of the BS and I would be here for it. The show would pay for itself for the next decade if they ran that storyline. And that's it for this episode of Ten Fro is Reading. You know, I talked cash-ish all last year. I hope the listening audience will continue to enjoy my opinion and not so subtle shade. I mean, I'm 2,000 listeners per episode in, so go run tell that haters. I may take it on the road if I get hint hint sponsorship. Navigate to dalesangelsinc.blog for swag and extended podcast notes. Don't forget to hit like or leave a five-star review. It gets me on top of the algorithms and it may just get you on my show. 2023's motto is boss up and get the bag. And as always, tell a friend and thank you for listening.